Time is on my, well, is it? I mean, we rarely kill time. We hate to waste time. We never want to lose time. We're willing to buy time, even if we're on borrowed time. I mean, it's fashionable to say we live in interesting times. Uh, however, the creep of time will catch up to us all. And even if you've had a good time or a devil of a time or hit it big time, time flies. It's about time, literally. Today, I want to talk to you about time. What I want to do is give you some definitions. Uh, we want to talk about some ways that we might be able to better parse time and then ultimately talk about how we might be able to control the clock, which I would call a strategic leader competency. It's trying to control the clock. So what I want to do is start at the operational level. If I could. Start at the operational level, which really says control of time, space, and force and their interaction is the key prerequisite for successful military planning and operations. Effectively, what it says is we want to keep time, space, and force in balance. And if we do, we preserve opportunity, options, freedom of action. And what we would argue is the higher you go from the tactical to the operational to the strategic level, the more there is need for harmony between time, space, and force. Now, here at the Army War College, we do a pretty good job about talking about space. Let's face it, when it comes to theorists, we do it by space. Claws with Sun Tzu, land power, okay, great. Then we do air power, we talk about Duhay and Billy Mitchell. All right, in the Navy, we got Mahan and Corbett, good. Uh, and then we talk about how we do regional studies. We divide the world into geographic areas, and then we study, spend time studying them. We have combatant commanders that are responsible for areas of responsibility somewhere on this earth. Uh, we even talk about domains and how we might use those, again, another division of the space, and even command and control with a joint force land component commander, a joint force maritime component commander, a joint force air component commander. So let's call space pretty good. Uh, force, we do that pretty well as also. If you think about military strategy and campaigning, it's one of the courses we teach here at the Army War College. We talk about how services present forces to those combatant commanders so that they have trained ready forces that they can go ahead and operate with. And we use things like joint functions to try and integrate services from each of them that they might be able to operate together. When we do things like defense management here, we talk about how we might resource that, that we could man, train, equip, sustain, maintain, and retain talent within that force. And if we bring any service chief here, they will talk to you about the forces that they're responsible for. So I think we do a pretty good job about talking about force. Now, at time, it's not that we don't talk about time, we do. It's ubiquitous. And in strategic leadership, we talk about thinking in time, which is a way to think critically. If we look at a problem over a span, we have a better idea of how we might be able to def better define the problem or approach to it. Uh, when we think about how we talk about war as a clash of wills, but it's also a competitive decision-making cycle. Hence, we talk about things like the OODA loop, the observe, orient, decide, and act. And if you can do that, you're going to touch a complex adaptive system. So while your other competitor is just starting to observe or orient, you've just changed the system. And their decisions become more and more irrelevant over time. Okay, well, as we talk about there, uh, when we do MSC, we talk about how we might use time phase force deployment data or tip bids for our mature plans about how we might sequence forces overseas. Okay, so we do talk about time. But the question is, are we precise enough with it? Colin Gray calls time the most unforgiving dimension of strategy. And we know it's important in strategies because we see it all the time. Even in our interim national security uh, directive that we got uh, just last year, it's only 22 page glossy. And in that, there are 15 references to time. Okay, well, it must be pretty important. Eh? If we go to joint publication 5.0, how we do uh, joint planning, there are 373 references to time, timelines, time frames, which is 97 more references than when we wrote the same pub three years ago. If you think about JP30 operations, well, we have another 221 references, which was 11 more than the time before. So apparently time is not only important, it's becoming more important the closer we get to the future. So the question is, do we use the right precision? Because we speak about it often. So what I want to offer you is potentially, did I get a slide? Thank you. A model, and it's an old one. What I would offer you on the left side of there is Kronos. This is the Greek god of time. We would know this is the quantitative ticking of a clock. It's quantitative time. The sum is equal to the whole of the parts, and all the parts are equal to. It's scientific. It's almost deterministic. In fact, what you had in the past kind of determines what you have now. And what you have now will in part determine what you have in the future. Uh, so this is what we think of when we look at the clock. 
Okay, now, Kronos, of course, is one of the most evil, cruel gods out there. In fact, if you think about the hierarchy up there on Mount Olympus, it's number three, because merely by the quantitative ticking of the clock, he will lay us all low. He's cruel. Uh, now, the dilemma with this, in this dimension of time, we all operate in it simultaneously. It's a corporate dimension. So when this is all done, when the last question is done, we walk back to Christ, we will all be an hour closer to being dead. Every one of us. We're all operating in this dimension simultaneously. Okay, good. Now, the other one we have is Kairos. Now, Kairos is the opportune moment. It's the supreme moment. It's the emergence of understanding. It is no longer about time. It's about timing. Now, all of a sudden, time isn't scientific. It's artistic. The whole and the sum of the parts, and the parts aren't all equal either. What we do is get to weigh one moment over another. And now we get to go ahead and impact that flow of time. Now, all of a sudden, time becomes fungible. And you guys all know, uh, for all those veterans out there, you, you, we talk about the unforgiving minute of combat. Or maybe it was the minute between asking your spouse whether or not she'll marry you, waiting for her to give the answer. That was a longer minute than the other minutes. <laughs> and you guys have all taken Christmas vacation. You know that week will fly by. And yet, that's the same length as the other 51 weeks this year. But the time isn't equal. It's fungible. Now, here's the benefit, at least on this side of Kairos. On Kairos, everyone operates independently. You get to pick the timing of your decision. You get to weigh what matters and what doesn't, and now get the time to interact with that other dimension of time. In fact, it's one of the most uh, devious gods within the Pantheon. If you think about it, it walks along a razor's edge, holding out a scale, reaching out as if it might tip the scale for or against your favor at any one moment. So what I want to do is play with these two ideas. Next slide. Next slide. So first of all, let's talk Kronos. Kronos, if uh, some people would talk about the ticking the clock, Einstein would say time, all it is, is what a watch tells you. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks, Einstein. We expected more. Um, <laughs> think about uh, somebody else would say it's a physicist would tell you it's just so that all events don't happen in the exact same moment. Oh, that might be interesting. Other people will say it's a linear continuum of instance. Well, that might be true if you're a philosophy major. Here might be a workable definition for us. It is a way that we can sequence events in past, present, and future and determine the interval between those times. Okay, we can work with that. Now, if we think about that, though, this is why it becomes very difficult, this unforgiving dimension of time, this hardest aspect of strategy. It's why Napoleon would look at his marshals and say, ask me for anything but time. In our time-space continuum, lost space can be regained. Force is lost, assuming you're not at the bottom of the barrel, can be re, uh, replenished. But time once lost can never be gained. Time, it's a perishable skill. It's your most valuable asset. Now, it doesn't mean that people haven't tried to control the clock. After the French Revolution, the French tried to go to a 10-day week, trying to separate the revolutionary state from the church. That failed. Uh, Soviet Union, after its great revolution, they tried to go to a five-day work week, in which everybody would have their own individual day off. So farmers had Monday, uh, city workers had Tuesday, factory workers had Wednesday. That was a disaster. They're back at a seven-day week, too. So our ability to control the clock gets to be a little bit difficult. But it doesn't mean people haven't tried. 2016, Saudi Arabia left the lunar calendar and moved to the solar calendar. They moved to the Gregorian calendar, the same way we are, so that they could pay their federal employees 11 fewer days. Effectively, for monetary decisions, they moved and changed the time. So it's something to think about. But remember, what we have to understand is that time is a, it's a human construct. It's culturally dependent. It matters on our history. It matters on our science, and it matters upon our religion. So even if we start with a simple, like, okay, let's just agree. Uh, it's 2022. Well, not really. It's your 1401 in Iran. It's your 1582 in Israel. It's your 2565 in Thailand. So there's a Muslim, Hebrew, and Buddhist view of the clock. Oh, it's your 111 in North Korea, which is mildly interesting because that would be from the birth of uh, Kim Il-sung which may be also the most accurate thing to ever come out of North Korea is it's probably an accurate reflection of how much progress they've made in the modern era. <laughs> so it is a human construct, but it also means there's a perspective piece here. So if you ask an infantryman, a tanker, a ship driver, a fighter pilot, and a cyber warrior, hey, what does 40 miles mean to you? Well, for an infantryman, he might tell you that's two days. For a tanker, he'll tell you it's two hours. For a ship driver, he'll tell you it's three hours. For a fighter pilot, it's four minutes. And for a cyber warrior, it's a nanosecond. So now all of a sudden you see where time and space become fungible, even depending upon their perspectives. Next slide, please. So there are different perspectives of time, mostly in North America, the northern part of Europe, Germany, Netherlands, England, Scandinavia. They have a linear view of time. 
a monochromatic view of time. Time is a fast flowing river. And if you want to take advantage of it, you better get on it because time is money. Anybody that's ever paid a lawyer or a doctor, you know, time is money. OK, that's a very Western way. It's a, it's a product of the Protestant work ethic that this is how we view time. And what we do is we take that time and we break it up into individual segments. That's why we all have four to-do apps on our phone, because what it's trying to tell you is break up your to-dos into a bunch of little chunks that you can really focus on, because that's how you get things done. It gives us a short-term short orientation, and it's also very future-focused. Think about it. Most of us are part of the United States, at least in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, this is important that we're future-focused, because if our families were anything in the past, they would have remained in the nations that they started in. But they weren't, so they left, and they came here. And the past doesn't matter, and why would you trip over a rock that's behind you? We're all looking forward. We are monochromatic, future-oriented. So this is the way that many of us look at time. Next slide, please. However, if you've ever visited Europe or you know someone from Portugal or Spain or Italy or Greece or Turkey or somewhere around the Mediterranean, even in the Arab world, well, they have a multi-active or a polychromatic view of the world. All of a sudden, it's not so much the time that matters, but time is really a series of events and relationships. So you guys know if you've ever had a, have a lunch meeting, uh, you say, hey, well, I'm gonna meet you at one o'clock. And they're gonna come bebopping up the street at 145. <laughs> it's okay, they see no problem with this because it's not about the time, it's that we have the meeting. Oh, by the way, why would I ever leave early? The reason to have the meeting was to build our relationship, to fix a problem, to address an issue, to gain understanding. I wouldn't leave until that was complete. So, and I, by the way, I don't know why you're so bunched up. I'm going to spend an extra hour with you too. So the next guy's going to get hosed for that 60 minutes. It's all going to work out. <laughs> so it's okay, but it's a polychromatic view of life. And what it has is a very now focused. We want to be in the moment with the event, with that relationship. Next slide. please. Now, if you travel to the East, and granted, I'm painting with a very broad brush now, but in the Far East, there's a cyclical view of time. Look, the sun rises, the sun sets. Winter comes and then spring, then summer, then fall, then winter again. Uh, in fact, they almost scoff at the idea that the linear view of time, fast flowing river. What are you crazy? It's all cyclical. Babies are born, the elderly pass away, and it all starts again. In fact, you can't even see the future, so I don't know why you call it a river. The whole thing's on this big bend. You never get to see around the bend. And now it's not a matter of trying to control time in any way. We don't break it up into segments. What we need to be is in harmony with time and those around us. In fact, they would scoff at the idea that we would use the expression, uh, I wish I knew then what I know now. <laughs> they would go, great, imagine what you'll know tomorrow. And so you can see how this might drive some problems if we're trying to do business with an ally or a partner, because we're sitting there going, hey, time is money, we need a decision. They're like, oh, no, this is only going to get better tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm on a plane. So you can see where this runs into some <laughs> issues as far as our understanding. Now, there's also different cultures over there. If you think about the Japanese or the reason that, you know, the lotus flower is the uh, symbol of Japan. They're a wrapping culture, right? Everything has a beginning and a middle and an end. And they're very formalized and there's structure within society and also in each event. If anybody's ever done business there, there is the formal two-minute exchange of business cards. This is incredibly important. It means the relationship has begun. And you have to take the two minutes to go, oh, that's a really interesting business card. And you should read all the things on there. And he should do the same. And this is a whole thing because once we're done going, oh, thank you for this business. Oh, this is wonderful. He oh, it's so classy. Oh, Lotus Flower, great. And then you put that in your pocket. And then, but that's the beginning of the relationship. And it's not until that's done that you can begin the next thing. Uh, there's a wonderful expression that talks about they don't look at linear time, it's cyclical, where we would sit there and, and outline A, B, C, D, E, and F. What they would do is walk up and look at a pond and walk around it and see all those letters in there. And they would take a stroll around it for a while. And then what they would come out of it and go, you know what? A, F, and D are really important. We should do those. So they're going to do A, F, and D. And then along the way, they're going to discover G. We should have done G. It wasn't even in the pond when we walked around it. But that's actually the most important thing. And as far as, you know, B, C, and E, those don't matter. We're not even going to get around to it. It is a different view of the clock, the Kronos clock. Next slide. So let's talk Kairos, the supreme moment, the opportune moment, the emergence of meaning. Um, if we think about this, um, when we talk, at least as far as military decision makers, oftentimes we throw this in uh, the idea of kudoi, uh, this with the sweep of an eye. 
It's a French expression. It means we take all the things that we can measure, force and structure and numbers, and then we take all the things that we don't know, we're gonna make some assumptions about them, and then we'll take some rums filling in uh, unknown unknowns. We gotta account for them even though we don't know what they are. And then we gotta account for things that we know count but can't measure, leadership, experience, esprit, will. And with a sweep of an eye, we take all those together and then we make our decision about the supreme moment. And if you do that really well, it's genius. Right, so the French call it coup d'oeil. The Germans call it finger spits and gefühl, the touch of the hand. Montgomery would call it the grip. Right, it's an understanding far beyond what you can gather all in one to understand both the enemy, the environment, and ourselves, and come out with a proper calculation of how those all mesh together. Now, this also starts to be less about process and more about the decision or action. It's about an inflection point, a decision point. And when we think about this, what it really is. If we think that we can't really change that dominion of time, chronos, you can't. Clock's just going to keep on ticking at you. So I almost view this as the way we view history. There's two views of history, and they're held in tension with one another. We have a structural view of history. The American Revolution, foregone conclusion that the United States should be free. Well, because we're a long way from England, they're developing their own identity, they have their own economy, uh, they got their own philosophy. Uh, England's a long way from home, they got European problems. It was a foregone conclusion the American Revolution should work out in America's way. You can do that, that's a structural view of history. But then we also know, what about George Washington? What about the founding fathers? What about crossing the Delaware on Christmas Eve? That's contingency. That changes that flow of history. And history is always a tension between that structural and that contingency aspect of history. What I would argue is time is always gonna be a tension between Kronos, which we cannot impact, and Kairos. When we reach in and we touch the clock and go, that moment matters more than anyone else. So if you think about uh, Yamamoto sitting there on the 6th of December and says, now is the moment the fate of the empire hangs in the balance. And then they launch their attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, it isn't to say that, again, people haven't tried to control the clock. You know, if you've ever looked at the Soviet Union spanned 11 time zones, bureaucratically set up, by the way. If you want to know how well they did that to try and empathetically understand what each of their states made up, look what happened once the Soviet Union crumbled. Everybody hopped into the time zone of their choice. <clears throat> it was an effort to go ahead and try and control the clock. But ultimately, what we are talking about in Kairos is our ability to either accelerate a decision point or an inflection point or slow it down. We are trying to impact the decision. We are trying to impact the clock by when we make our decision, by when we act, by when we make our announcement. Next slide. So what I would offer is perhaps there are some questions we should ask if we actually want to try and control the clock. The first one is, is the clock on our side or not? If we think about, you know, we study the Peloponnesian War here. Uh, Sparta's looking at a rising Athens and goes, well, if we wait, is the clock in our favor or not? The longer we let Athens grow, it's not in our favor. We had better act now. Okay, that's one way to think about it. Um, I, I would offer up that perhaps there is an options test. Would we have more options now or if we waited? I think about uh, England in 1940. Uh, most of the rest of Europe has fallen. Uh, British Army gets booted out of Dunkirk. They sit over there, and this is when Churchill gives his famous speech in front of the House of Commons. We will fight them in the landing barriers. We will fight them on the beaches. We will fight them in the fields and in the cities. We will fight them in the hills. We will never give up. But even if, and I don't think for a minute it's so, that this island or part of this island would be starving and subjugated, our great empire, protected by the Royal Navy, will continue the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and all its might, will come to the rescue and the liberation of the old. He's playing for time. He's slowing the clock down until God's good time that the new world comes in on the half of their side. Or until the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor and then Germans declare war on the United States four days later. But either way, he's trying to slow the clock. You can also try and accelerate the clock. I think about Israel in 1967. All its neighbors are building up combat power. If they all strike at once, Israel doesn't stand a chance. So they cite Article 51 of the UN Charter and they preemptively attack their neighbors. While they're still in their marshalling yards, they effectively accelerate the clock ahead of their timelines. And a six day war, it's a massive victory for Israel, accelerating and slowing the clock, depending on whether you have more options or not. Another one we might ask ourselves will you be more prepared or not? It's a little more of an internal look. Or will you be less prepared if you wait? I think about 78 years and two days ago, you know, General Eisenhower trying to make the weather call. 
right? He knows all the factors that are involved. Hey, uh, sitting there in the rain, it's pouring, we no, the worst storm ever gonna hit the Channel Islands. We've been setting this thing up for two years. Everybody's out there trying to get it done. I've already delayed it a day just to get the weather conditions of tide and sky conditions. That's 13 to one. By the time I add in the moon, that gets it to 20 to one. By the time I try and get the moon to set right before the, uh, right before the landing starts so that my ships don't get targeted, now it's at 81 odds that I ever get these conditions again. I can wait another two weeks, but if I wait two weeks, will we be more prepared? Probably not. We've raised this thing to a razor's edge for this moment. Oh, by the way, if I give it two more weeks, the Germans could lay more mines, build more obstacles. They've already put more troops in Normandy. And oh, by the way, what if they figure out we're going to Normandy and not Calais? So he famously says, how long can you take this operation? Hang it on the edge of a, on the edge of a branch and let it hang. I'm positive the decision must be made. Let's go. What he recognizes by preparation alone, we will be more prepared now than if we waited. The Murphy test. The Murphy test is everybody here is familiar with Murphy's law. Anything can go wrong, will go wrong, which means it's a risk question. Can you live with the consequences? Both their likelihood and their scale. If you act now or if you wait. Now, there's an old parable told in, in Israel talks about the time when the Romans occupied Israel. There was another rebellion going on. Local Roman leader says to uh, the town, hey, I'm going to destroy your town next week because I'm sure there are rebels in your town. So it falls to the uh, town elder to go speak to the ruler. And he goes, oh, please don't destroy my town. He goes, yep, I'm definitely going to destroy your town. I'm sure there's rebels there. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. And he looks and he sees a hound laying at the ruler's feet. And he goes, sir, is that your dog? And he goes, yeah. He goes, here's the thing. If you give me one year, because it only takes me a year, if you give me a year and don't destroy my village, I'm going to teach your dog how to dance. And the ruler goes, huh, well, I don't really care about that village. And there's other villages to destroy. And who doesn't want to see a dog dance? And so what he does is he turns to the old man and says, deal. I won't destroy your village. Here's my dog. Old man walks out with the dog, goes back to the village. The town at first is appalled. Oh, my gosh, it stole the emperor's dog. No, no, no. He gave it to me. OK, why? What's going on? Don't worry, gang. The village is saved for a year. And they go, how'd you do that? He goes, well. I just told them, hey, I'm going to take this next year, teach the dog how to dance. And then to their horror, they're like, oh, my gosh, we're screwed because he doesn't know how to teach dogs how to dance. And he goes, you missed the point. Do you know what could happen in a year? The rebellion might succeed. He might be recalled to Rome. He might have a heart attack. I might actually learn how to teach a dog to dance. There's contingency in here, right? Anything could happen. And the consequence of not doing anything is that this village gets destroyed today. But if we wait a year, who knows? I can live with those. So I think about that. The other one I think about is our defense strategic guidance of 2012, which is when we finally admit we will no longer fight two major theater wars at once. Think about what this means vis-a-vis -vis timing. It means one is a win immediately. Uh, it is definitely go attack, win as fast as you can. It's entirely on our monochromatic way that we want to fight as fast and as violent and get it done as fast as we can. Okay, good. But in the other theater, we're going to delay deny objectives and impose costs. That's not our culture. And oh, by the way, we didn't develop a delay, deny, and impose costs force. We're the go win fast force. Should we develop a new one? Can we live with those consequences? I don't know. We should also keep in mind, all these are both uh, rolled up together. You can look at your options, your preparation, and your risk. And I would suggest that you should. On top of that, know that these are all competitive because the enemy gets a vote. They are also doing these SEM tests because you don't just get to operate on this Kronos timeline with your timing alone. They get to as well. OK, so what I want to do is give you a one quick sample of what this might look like. Next slide. So I'm going to take you back to 1862. Uh, Civil War, Eastern Theater. Robert E. Lee is the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. This is the principal Confederate army in the Eastern Theater. He just gets command. On the day he gets command, his back is to the wall of Richmond. He can hear the church bells in Richmond ringing when he takes command. So whenever you feel bad about your new job, think about that for a minute. Anyway, he can hear that, right? Hey, here you go, hey, Robert. Don't screw this up. Okay, so here he goes. Now, what he's going to do in the next 90 days, first he'll dig in for 30. Then he's going to do the seven days campaign. He's going to drive that Union army back from the gates of Richmond. They will eventually be recalled to Washington. Then he's going to turn his army 90 degrees, go north, go defeat uh, General Pope in the second battle of Bull Run at the end of August. He's going to drive them into Washington. In fact, he's going to be chasing them, pursuing them all the way to the gates of Washington. So 90 days later, he's looking at the spires of Washington. And then he goes, what next? 
Would I have more options if I waited? Not really. Would I be more prepared if I waited? Not really. So he's going to write a letter back to Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, and then it says, now is the most propitious time since the commencement of the war for this army to enter in to Maryland. Policy change. Now all of a sudden the Confederacy is invading the North because we might have more options if we do this. Effectively, what he's saying is he's trying to accelerate the clock. He knows two defeated Union armies are in Washington. They're going to have to put something together to send them back out in the field. And if he could annihilate them in one climactic battle, he would probably provide the ultimate evidence to that Northern population that this war is no longer worth it. So he's trying to accelerate the clock, at least operationally, on the North. Well, at the same time, inside Washington, D.C., Abraham Lincoln is already looking at a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. He reads it to his cabinet. And Secretary of State Seward says, yep, that's a pretty good idea. But you can't issue it right now. Bad timing. If you issue that right now, it would come off as the last cry of a defeated government. And Lincoln says, yeah, that's a pretty good point. So he's got to put that back in his desk. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, France has already told England, hey, we'll recognize the Confederacy if you will. And England has decided after a year and a half of war and the victory at Second Bull Run, guess what? Confederacy is a country. After summer break, we're going to come back and here's what we'll do. We'll offer to mediate the war. Union knows they're not going to accept that. So at that point, when they don't accept it, we're going to recognize the Confederacy. Okay, we're going to put that on the schedule. Ultimately, what happens is Robert E. Lee will cross the Potomac River on the 4th of September. Next slide. He will cross the Potomac River on the 4th of September. On the 17th of September, in 12 hours of fighting, it will be the bloodiest single day in American history, the Battle of Antietam, 23,000 casualties. That's one casualty every two seconds for 12 hours. They fight that battle. Ultimately, it's a bit of a push. Both armies are on the field at the end of the day. But the next day, the 18th of September, Robert E. Lee pulls back across the Potomac River and effectively ends the campaign. Operationally, maybe a tie. But for Lincoln, it's the end of that invasion, and that's just enough of a victory. Now is the supreme moment. Now is the emergence of meaning. And now, on the 22nd of September, he issues his preliminary emancipation proclamation, which effectively frees no slaves in any of the border states or in any of the territory that the Union Army already occupies. But what it says is, hey, all you states in rebellion, if you don't come in back in the proper relationship with the federal government in the next 90 days, after that, every inch forward that the Union Army goes, any slave that comes in our lines are then, thenceforth, and forever free. He changes the war. It's not only about the preservation of the Union, it will now either be about the destruction of the United States or the destruction of the Confederacy. The war is now binary, but we will be different for having done this. Think about how he captures the clock. Effectively, what he does is now he accelerates the war strategically on the South because it says, now I'm going to attack your economic and your social base. It's those slaves working in the behind the lines that are freeing up white manpower for the South to go fight the war. So if I go attack that economic base, now your problems are going to get harder. That's interesting. But what does it do across the ocean? Well, England had gotten out of slavery in the 1830s. France has gotten out of it in the 1840s. Around here, we talk about a policy strategy model that starts with enduring values and beliefs, and that drives our interests, and interest drives policy, policy drives strategy. We put ends, ways, and means, and assess it against risks. But it starts with enduring values and beliefs. And when Abraham Lincoln says, then thenceforth and forever free, he puts a value proposition in front of the economic interest of France and England to recognize the Confederacy. He stops their clock. He reaches across the Atlantic Ocean says you're done, all with a stroke of a pen. And because it's the information of the elements of national power, it goes that fast. It's brilliant. Next slide. So here's some recommendations. First of all, if you think about senior leaders, we'd say you need to be mentally agile. What we really mean now is that you be cross-culturally agile, savvy. If you want to be effective at the senior levels, we had better start to understand how do our allies and partners view the clock? You can see how this goes wrong. We end up with an interest or information asymmetry. Our allies and partners say, are you in? Yeah, I'm in. You sure you're in? Yeah, I'm definitely in. They go all in. We put some in because we're like, well, this is going to go for the next three years. And they look at us and go, hey, you're not all in? And just like that, we view the clock differently and we don't understand one another. Moreover, shouldn't we do a better job of understanding how our adversaries look at the clock? We constantly act as if we are playing on our own clock rather than on theirs as we try and influence their decision calculus, our ability to deter or influence the decisions they make. This is where we talk about conceptual confidence and why it matters, cross-culturally savvy. Okay, that works. Because what we're really trying to avoid is that whole notion of you have the watches and we have the time. They understood our concept of time. So when we think about that, for a nation that is monochromatic and our ability to fight quickly, 
Should we not view how we fight slowly? Perhaps you could say we're experimenting with that right now in Ukraine. It's an interesting thought. What we really have to understand, though, are the mechanisms of how we might impact using our Kairos, our timing, to impact that Kronos clock. In this case, maybe it's how we use the instruments of national power. Diplomacy is like constant pressure. Think about it, it's always taking place, waging diplomacy. This is how we build allies and partners. It's how we get access. These are things we do even when we're not at war. This is some of the make our own luck now before we actually need it. Okay, but it takes, it's not immediate and it doesn't take place right away. Okay, so we, we have some other things. Information law and power. Well, that's really fast. It's super quick, really imprecise. and has to be followed up all the time with reinforcing instruments of national power with regard to information. Economics, well, maybe our most powerful tool, but we know we get to announce it right away, but it takes a long time for them to be in place, which means we got to actually synchronize with the diplomatic instrument so that we can get other nations to go ahead and economically align their efforts to align with ours so that that economic pressure might be felt sooner so that we can accelerate that decision. Okay, that's good. On the military side, well, you got your full range. You got your below, below the threshold of combat. All those activities we're doing around the world, building other nations' capacity and, and uh, capability, credibility, access to those places. Right, we do that before. From cyber to immediately impact now or go change a government, which could take months or years if we go to war. But as a strategic leader, you better know how those tools both integrate and the timelines upon which they play. Okay. What we're really talking about is this idea of inflection. point. How do we accelerate or decelerate a decision? Ours are theirs. On top of that, the last thing to think about is maybe on a personal level. If we went down to the Pentagon today, you would find most of our senior leaders, our general officers, generally speaking, are overscheduled and underworked. Mm -hmm. They are. Their schedules are packed. But how much do they actually get done in a day? I, I, I bring this up as an issue. We are monochromatic. We are trained to be this way. It doesn't have to be how we are. What if we started scheduled meetings with general's officers that says, hey, boss, we're not going to finish this until you understand the issue. <laughs> what? Because right now it goes, hey, boss, this one's done. Roger that. Hey, let's get them back in here. Get them on the schedule again. Yeah, that's efficient. Right? And you, meanwhile, the boss doesn't have understanding. We're going to go another week and a half before we can get that person back in there. And then we're trying to build off. What about how, how about we have the how about we have the meeting long enough to establish a relationship or fix a relationship or build the relationship? And if it takes 10 minutes instead of 30 minutes, great. Call it complete. You don't actually have to sit there the other 20 minutes. Because here's the rub gang. We're playing for an, a finite number of minutes. And the truth be told, you don't have enough minutes. So stop playing for minutes. I would say what we have to do is become a little more polychromatic. Start playing for moments. You have an infinite number of moments. Think about it. If I told you to go back in your own memory right now and go, remember your first day of school. First day you went to school. My guess is none of you went back and went, oh yeah, September 2nd, 19, whatever. Uh, 7.30 in the morning, I caught the bus, 8.02, school bell rang. That's monochromatic time. What you remember is mom held my hand out by the bus stop. I remember climbing on the bus. I remember seeing my first teacher. And on that day I sat down to a kid that became my best friend. Events, relationships. Tells you how powerful they are. That's what you remember. That's what your life actually is, is a collection of relationships and events. So I would argue a recommendation for us is to become slightly more polychromatic than this hard and fast monochromatic rolling river of time, which we subdivide into as many micro pieces as we possibly can, thinking that we are focusing and being incredibly efficient. And we might be being more efficient, but I would argue we're not being any more effective. So I've said this is about time. I've used mine. I appreciate yours. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? <laughs>